How's it going, folks? This is Mike, and I'm back for the final episode of my Halloween countdown, talking about the Edgar Allan Poe films directed by Roger Corman in the 1960s. And uh, I'm a day late because Halloween's already over, and now it's All Saints Day, so maybe I should call it an All Saints Day countdown, but that probably doesn't have the same same kind of atmosphere with it. Okay, um, so the first film to talk about, there are only two left, 1964, The Mask of the Red Death, on this double feature with Premature Burial, The Mask of the Red Death. You know, I've started this, um, or attempted to start this video four times now. For some reason, I'm stumbling all over myself trying to figure out how I want to talk about The Mask of the Red Death. I don't know why I'm having so much trouble, because it it's such an impressive film. It really has to be called the crown jewel of all the uh, Corman Poe films from a standpoint of the complexity of the story, the uh, the visuals. I mean, it's just a, it has an amazing look to it. it. It's another one of Corman's relatively low budget films, but it looks like they spent $10 million to make this film. It's just absolutely gorgeous. The sets. Um, it This time the cinematography was by Nicholas Roeg. And the art direction was by Robert Jones. The uh, production design was by Daniel Haller, who usually does the art direction. Uh, screenplay by Charles Beaumont, along with R. Wright Campbell. And it, it's, it's a very, very serious and very dark story. Now, Corman had actually wanted to make this film when they first began the Edgar Allan Poe series. One of his first choices. But that was back in 1960, and he was afraid that because of the whether well, similarities between what uh, Edgar Allan Poe has in the story about the figures of death, the figure of death, and he thought that people would compare it with um, the Seventh Seal, which had come out fairly recently. It had the, the figure of death in black, and he was afraid of being, you know, people saying that he was just imitating Bergman. But a few years down the road, he didn't really care. He just wanted to make the film, and it does have uh, it does have a lot of uh, similarity to the, the symbolism in the Bergman film. But uh, it's yeah, it's it's very very impressive and very dark. Fitzgerald Price in one of his greatest performances um, plays Prince Prospero, who is a very cruel landowner in the Middle Ages, and lives in a, a gorgeous palace. And the, the villagers around him are all dirt poor, and they all work for him. And he's known for his cruelty. And he um, he goes he goes to the village to invite the people to a end of harvest festival, where they can basically just eat the scraps off the tables. And um, a couple of men in the in the village they become very defiant. They pass along a message that was given to an old woman. And at the very beginning of the film, there's an old woman walking on a, a, a misty hill, and she sees a man sitting next to a tree. This is a man dressed all in bright red. His, his head is covered, can't see his face, and he gives this woman a blood red rose. And he says, take this back to your people and tell them their deliverance is at hand. Well, what she doesn't know is this man is actually a figure of death, specifically the Red Death, which is a plague. But she takes that back to her village. So when Prince Prospero was there, these two men defy him, and he basically condemns them to be killed right at that moment by his, his men. And a beautiful young girl named Francesca, played by Jane Asher, runs forward and says, please spare them. And one of the men is her father, the other man, man is the man that she's in love with, the young man. And Prospero, first says, well, I'm, I'm going to give you the chance to decide which one will live and which one will die. So while this little conflict is going on, he is told by one of his men that the, the plague, the Red Death, has been seen in the village. So Prospero decides to burn the village to the ground, and he takes, he takes the girl and the two men with them. The men are going to be imprisoned in the palace. The girl is going to be taken into the, the upper areas of the palace, not the dungeon, and he's going to try to corrupt her, right? She, she is the symbol of purity and Christian faith and goodness. And he is a Satan worshiper and he wants to bring her into his dark world. So we go back to the palace and we see this uh, 
the, these opulent surroundings that he lives in, we meet his voluptuous, beautiful wife, Juliana, played by Hazel Court in her third appearance in a Poe film. Very good performance. And she is not happy that this young girl has been brought back. And if we find out that Juliana is a very serious worshiper of Satan and wants to basically be wedded to him. So that, that kind of shows you how where these people's minds are at. So the, the film progresses from there. It, it basically, it shows the, um, the, the corruption that these, all the people who live in the, who are in the palace, the rich people, the, the wealthy, the, the, the people who are hangers on to Prospero because of his power and his wealth and his influence, uh, how decadent they are and how they they have no concern with what's going on outside the palace walls and about the people who are suffering and they don't want to let them in and let the red death come in and affect them and uh, it also shows how the young girl Francesca tries very hard to resist although she has a very simple kind of a faith where she can't really understand why she believes what she does and she gets very confused by Prospero talking about the corruption of the world and what's real and what isn't and how do you know there is a God? Why don't you worship Satan who is the God of honesty and truth? And uh, it gets gets very involved. And and at the end of the film there's going to be this uh, masquerade ball which is the mask of the title. And uh, that's that's when the, the figure of the Red Death appears among the people who are dancing. So and I'm giving a lot of, I'm giving you a lot away here, giving a lot away to you here, and once again giving you spoilers. But um, this this is a very powerful film, and I have to say that it's not an easy film for me to watch. It it's so serious and so dark, and there's a lot of ugliness and violence in this film that for me it's not a, a an enjoyable, fun horror movie experience in the same way that The Pit and the Pendulum is for me. I can enjoy watching The Pit and the Pendulum. I can enjoy watching The Haunted Palace, you know, again and again. And it's still a very dark story, but uh, The Mask of the Red Death is on another level entirely. But I, I totally respect it. I just have, you know, infinite regard for this movie and what they were able to accomplish. So, um, it's highly recommended. If you've never seen this, if you never want to see another Edgar Allan Poe film made by Roger Corman, please give The Mask of the Red Death a chance. I think that you will be impressed by it. The next film is the last one in the series, released in 1965, and this is The Tomb of Lygia. The Tomb of Lygia, which is on a, a double bill here with Vincent Price, um, reading from the stories of Edgar Allan Poe, which is basically a stage performance. It's very, very cool, very impressive. But yeah, that, that came later on. Uh, it certainly wasn't part of the Corman series. But. So by this time, Roger Corman was definitely tired of making the, uh, the, the Poe films, and he wanted to try to do something a little bit different. Now, The Mask of the Red Death was the first film that they, they made in England, and they made the Tomb of Lygia in England as well. And it was the first time that he went out on location. He found this ruined abbey church, an abbey of a monastery. And uh, he filmed around the ruins and the graveyard and uh, just gorgeous photography. But it's very, very different from what we've seen in the other Poe films because it is a real setting as opposed to, you know, a, a series of matte paintings and uh the dark interiors. Um, let's see, the screenplay this time was by Robert Town. The photography was by Arthur Grant. The art direction was by Colin South, Southcott. And filmed on location in England, uh, ruined abbey of a monastery. And I'm not, I'm not, I think it was the Norwich Monastery. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. But um, it, a lot of it was filled during the day. Corman made, made a remark that this, this film had more sunlight than all of his other films put together. And he he wanted to try something different by, sh by shooting real locations. Uh, he also shot some of the countryside and a, a beautiful English church. And um, But w once he saw the film, he felt that his original idea of keeping the, the, the Poe films shot in on sets and enclosed interiors and a lot of darkness, he thought that was... Um, 
in the end a better idea. But this is still a very impressive film. Now they weren't allowed to shoot in the uh, the interiors of this old monastery, but so they filmed those on sets uh, in England. And it's very, very different. The interiors, they do a terrific job. They make it look like it is an old ruined uh, monastery with the, the stone walls, very gray, very plain, and just kind of st strange and sparse furnishings all around this big space, lots of dust, lots of cobwebs. And the story is that in the beginning, a man named Verdon Fell, played by Vincent Price, is burying his beautiful young wife, Phygia, a beautiful black-haired woman who is of Egyptian ancestry, and she's not a Christian. And a minister is telling this man that you cannot you cannot bury her in, in consecrated ground. And Verdon Fell is very um, rebellious, and, and he says, it doesn't matter to me because she's not really dead anyway. She will never be dead. So flash forward uh, several months later, um, a, a beautiful young woman named Lady Rowena, played by Elizabeth Shepherd, uh, is is riding, uh, doing a fox hunt with some of her, her rich family and friends. And they come onto the property and she sees, she sees the grave of Lygia. And as soon as she pronounces the name Lygia, this black cat comes out of nowhere and uh, scares the horse. She falls off the horse, Verdon Fell comes to help her. As soon as they meet, there's there's this strange attraction, especially on her part, and she finds that she uh, can't keep away from this man. So she's drawn into his life of sadness and grief and seclusion, kind of reminds you of Roderick Usher in a way. And the story actually has a lot in common with Morella because this, the spirit of Lygia, which is seems to be living in this uh, this ruined monastery, is coming back to haunt this woman who very quickly uh, they they fall in love and they're married. Like I say, things happen very quickly in the Corman films, and right away the, uh, Rowena is finding that that her husband is definitely preoccupied with the the idea or the spirit of his first wife, whom Rowena is beginning to think is not really dead. So that's that's where it goes. It's a very simple story, probably in a way. At, at, after so many similar stories in, in the Poe series, this is really kind of weak. And it's only it's only brought to life really by the fact that the visuals are so different and the performances by both of the actors are so good. Although I think that all, all things considered, Vincent Price's performance is not up on the same level as Elizabeth Shepard. She was basically a, a newcomer to film. She had been in a couple of films before and before that, she had been another Shakespearean actress on stage. Beautiful, deep voice, uh, gorgeous woman. And she is very, very good in this. So it, the film is kind of, after The Massacre of the Red Death, I guess you'd have to say that The Tomb of Lygia is somewhat of a letdown. But even though it is still a very worthwhile film to see, and uh, I think that it, it kind of, it, it could have done a lot more with this atmosphere and maybe the story, but I think that, uh, yeah, it's still it's still worth seeing. And I guess that's all I want to say about the Tomb of Lygia. But, um, okay, so my series is done, and I'm sorry I was a day late. And uh, please tell me what you think about these two films I talked about and about Corman and Poe in general. So thank you for watching, and thanks for, uh, for those of you who stayed with me through all this. I hope you weren't disappointed. Thanks again.